My name is Jonna Powell. Um, I lead the advisory practice at Consensus, and I'm going to be talking about blockchain revolution use cases of today and of the future, um, and how it will change the world. Uh, more specifically, I'd like to talk about where we were, uh, where we are, and where many people think we're going. And then I'd like to deep dive on a couple of use cases. Um, decentralized finance, money, stores of value, tokenization, and Web 3.0. So I'd like to start first with a story uh, that's common to our all history, right? Um, Tesla has inspired me significantly. I did my PhD in electrical engineering. Um, spent a lot of time studying physics, and I think that uh, what Tesla did was just incredibly inspiring. Uh, and there are a lot of power uh, parallels uh, in terms of what he did uh, and what blockchain can do. So is anyone familiar with the current wars so eloquently commemorated by the band ACDC? So uh, I believe Alex alluded to this earlier today. He was talking about electricity and uh, relating it to blockchain. So the standard technology back in the late 1800s was direct current. That was invented by Edison, um, and he actually hired Tesla, Nikola Tesla, to help him with his direct current problems. Uh, Tesla actually just came up with a whole new solution of alternating current. Uh, it used thinner wires, higher voltages, transmitted power at higher distances, incredibly efficient, much, much better than direct current. Uh, it now powers nearly every home in the U.S. and uh, potentially the world. Um, by contrast, Edison's technology required a power plant every square mile. Um, it was inefficient. It couldn't transmit electricity at great distances, right? So it was clear what the superior technology was, but nevertheless, Edison did everything in his power to squelch the new technology, right? And that's why you saw that infographic that Alex presented earlier around electricity being so scary. Um, he said, fooling around with alternating current is just a waste of time. Nobody will use it ever. Um, he proceeded to use AC, alternating current, to power electric chairs. Um, he killed small animals. He killed an elephant just to demonstrate the danger uh, to the public. And that worked for a little while. Um, but, uh, and also you can... Uh, I can also mention that I think people in blockchain have done similar things, maybe not quite so obvious, but a little bit more subtle, uh, but equally nefarious. Um, nevertheless, it persisted. And when I say it, I mean Tesla, and I mean the technology. He secured a partnership with George Westinghouse, and they ensured the propagation of alternating current all throughout the country. Um, Andreas Antonopoulos has said of Bitcoin that good technology cannot be uninvented or stopped. And he's right. Tesla's work in alternating current and related technologies led to so many other innovations, including radio, wireless power, uh, x-rays, the transistor, the hydroelectric power plant, wireless communications, all of it. Um, and the way I see this uh, as being parallel to blockchain is that it's really alternating current was kind of a base technology. It was a base technology that created the foundation for thousands of other use cases, right, that have really, truly changed the world. Um, I'll repeat again, good technology cannot be uninvented and it cannot be stopped. Um, in the early 1900s, there was this sort of utopian feeling about radio. Nobody knew where it was going to go. Nobody knew you know, whether it was going to be completely decentralized or whether it was going to be centralized. But someone said, the invention of the radio has turned the nation into a town meeting. But there is no chairman. There's no parliamentary law. This will bring anarchy into the ether. And the same could be said today about blockchain, right? We all know what happened with radio. It wasn't this completely decentralized solution. Um, it became highly monopolized and highly regulated. But I think we would mostly agree that it was a fascinating technology that really did change the world. Um, so let's look at another system that I, I think a lot of us believe is ripe for uh, disruption, including John McAfee, who was so inspirational to watch. Um, the monetary system. The first use case, right, for blockchain and Bitcoin. So what is money and how is it created? This is a US example. And I know this slide is complex. I, made, I kept it complex on purpose because Einstein once said, make everything as simple as it is, but don't ever make it simpler than it is. 
right? And this is an incredibly complex process. It's a little bit shocking. And I think a lot of us are familiar with it, right? And that's why a lot of us are here. So how does it start? The government decides to do deficit spending. And that's by definition spending of money that we don't have. The Treasury then issues bonds, glorified IOUs. If you give me $200 billion, um, I'll give you that $200 billion 10 years from now plus interest. All right, so the government can spend uh, you know, the money of the future in order to do their, uh, to build their wall, Trump's wall, or public infrastructure, or whatever it is. Okay, so the Treasury issues bonds. Big banks then go into an auction. They purchase those bonds uh, with the promise of uh, profit and interest. Then, through a swap, the Federal Reserve purchases some of those securities. Um, but they purchase those securities by writing a check to the banks from an account with literally nothing in it. So magically, they're creating currency and they're injecting currency into the system. Okay, so that money then goes back to the government. The government does their government spending uh, on you know public work, public infrastructure, and so on. And where does that money go? That money goes to people like you and me uh, to pay us for our work. And what do we do with that money? We take it and we put it into the bank. What does the bank do with it? Well, we're effectively loaning the bank that money. And through fractional reserve lending, they actually only have to keep 10% of that in safe reserves, and they loan out 90% of the rest of it. How much interest are we getting back for loaning the banks our money? If we're getting more than 2%, we're lucky. Uh, so the banks, as they do fractional reserve lending, they keep multiplying the currency supply. Uh, it's estimated that 92 to 96% of the currency in existence is created in the banking system. Um, after that, okay, what happens? It's been a year, we've put our blood, sweat, and tears into earning this income and actually making this income valuable. And then we have to pay income taxes. So we can maybe be comforted that all of our income taxes are gonna be spent on public infrastructure, on welfare, on healthcare, and all of these things. But actually, seven to 10% of that income tax goes through the IRS, through the treasury, back to the Fed to pay interest on the bonds that the Fed purchased from an account with nothing in it. And so our debt ceiling continues to grow. Um, this system is just designed to continue to put us all in debt. Um, so people could say, you know, that's fine, I trust the system. Um, we're okay now. But we're, as, as you've seen, based on a lot of the talks today, we're not always okay. Um, so fiat currency can be created from nothing. There's interest due on every dollar in existence. Uh, seven to ten percent of our taxes are not used for public services, but to service the interest on bonds paid for the Fed from an account with nothing in it. You trust the banks, you trust the government. Okay, the system might work, but we know that it doesn't always work, and we know what happened in 2008. There's always more debt in the system than there is currency in existence to pay the debt. Um, in 2008, we know what happened. We toppled over as a result of irresponsible lending on the part of the banks uh, with risky assets. And this is essentially where Bitcoin and blockchain came into existence, was this massive problem of trust that we have in the system, uh, not only in our government, but also in our banking system. Okay, so Bitcoin and blockchain come out, out of the ashes, and I really like this infographic because I think of Bitcoin and blockchain as really this new wheel that was invented. It's this fascinating tool. Um, it's elegant, and virtually nobody knew how to use it for years. Um, but it was essentially created to be the new trustless monetary system. Um, it's an ingenious tool, right? It was invented to solve our first use case decentralized currency supply. We know what it is, we know how it works. I mean, it's an, an unchangeable timestamp ledger that holds transactions, it's ultra secure, uses cryptography to secure data, and miners keep the ecosystem secure by validating transactions. Why does it matter? I think most of us know why it matters. It's unchangeable, it's unverifiable, you can't confiscate it. It's virtually unhackable, it's incentivizable. There are built-in incentives to create a host of opportunities to incentivize behaviors like securing the network. Um, and 
Most importantly for Bitcoin, it's digitally scarce. There's only 21 million Bitcoins. Nobody's ever going to print new Bitcoin. Okay, so people might say, well, wait a second. You know, Bitcoin has just lost so much value, and this was even more relevant a few months ago. Um, this graph could look like any Bitcoin price uh, bubble burst graph, right? But actually, this is the purchasing power of the dollar. The red graph at the left is the purchasing power of the dollar uh, from 1913 until now. And we've lost 96% of the purchasing power of the dollar since then. The graph on the right is actually Bitcoin price, right? And what we see, I think my main takeaway is, okay, there's been a lot of ups and downs. We've had a lot of crashes, but we've had a lot of periods of exuberance. Um, and the trend line is always up, right? So we've had bull runs from 20, 2010 to 2011, 2011 to 2013, another short one in 2013, and then 2015 to 2017. And people would argue that we're in a bull run right now, or we're starting to be in a bull run right now. Um, so how many people here believe Bitcoin has pretty much won the contest of being a store of value? I think, okay, a, a fair amount of hands. Um, I was just at Ethereal, uh, a conference, uh, a conference about a month ago, and Mike Novogratz was there, and he basically said, look, I think at, at $120 billion market value, we can say Bitcoin has won. It's been long enough. It's, it's won its uh, proof of concept in terms of this use case. So let's think about additional use cases beyond stores of value. Um, so it's estimated that blockchain is going to create $3.1 trillion worth of value by 2030. Uh, you can see where we are right now in 2019, a market cap of $250 billion. It's not a, even a blip on that chart. Um, this analysis on the left was done by Gartner. The analysis on the right was done by McKinsey and Company. It's about a year old. Um, and what they did was they looked at all the various industries globally, um, and they looked at various metrics across which you might see um, uh, impact from blockchain technology implementation. Uh, and the takeaway of this is where you see, you know, medium to large blue bubbles, that's indicative of places where you should see value from blockchain technology for that particular industry, for the particular metric. So my takeaway is there's a sea of blue. There's going to be a lot of impact across all industries, across all metrics. Um, we've heard the herd is coming, right, in terms of mass adoption, but actually, I think the herd is here. And this is a reference to a Forbes article. It's the, the Forbes billion dollar babies that are making waves in blockchain. So all of these icons were actually referenced in the Forbes article that was written about a month ago. Um, you can see huge names. And you should probably recognize most of them, right? Facebook, we know what they're doing. Foxconn is a huge supply chain giant, uh, actively looking at uh, supply chain solutions. Coinbase is obvious. Google, BBVA, a huge Spanish bank um, with a highly, highly talented technical team looking at a whole bunch of blockchain research. So I would argue that the herd is here. Uh, we're not really waiting for enterprises to be interested in blockchain technology. Um, according to the International Data Corporation, spending on blockchain is estimated to be about $3 billion this year alone, and up to $12.5 billion by 2022. Uh, PwC survey indicated that 84% of executives are interested in blockchain or their companies are involved in blockchain. Um, so what is the world of the possible for blockchain? We know there are so many different use cases. I mean, obviously, we can't say blockchain is going to change everything. That's, that's ridiculous. We have to be reasonable. But um, this shows a lot of very practical applications for a bunch of different industries, and it's only maybe 25-plus different use cases. Um, there are 100 more. Um, I'll just go into a couple of them. Uh, but I have detailed descriptions of all of them if you're interested and happy to share all of them. Um, 
banking, financial, and fintech. Um, I mean, that's a big one. Obviously, it's a huge industry that uh, people are saying is going to be disrupted. Um, remittances, global remittances, breaking down uh, international borders is huge. Improving uh, access to credit and risk scoring. Uh, KYC, uh, an improvement of uh, costs related to fraud, is another use case there. Medical and healthcare um, is hugely disruptable and improvable through blockchain technology. Um, we have pharmaceutical uh, supply chains and supply chain management, medical device supply chain management. Um, clinical trials could be improved through having an auditable data trail. Um, also, patient data uh, can be improved significantly just in terms of the efficiency and in terms of actually allowing them to own their data um, and also recording every single point within the patient journey, which we don't do right now because all of the data is so fragmented in that industry. Um, data is actually huge, and this spans across every single use case you see on that slide. Um, Think about the, the concept of self-sovereign data, where you can turn the internet literally on its head, and instead of having fragments of your identity spread all across the internet, your sign-in and your login password for Gmail and Yahoo and Facebook and Instagram and banking and everything else, your, your identity is literally all over the place in fragments. You spin that on its head and you have your identity that you own with your data, your one password, you should be able to navigate through the internet without providing them with your data, unless it's on a permissioned basis, and you should profit from your data. These people should not be owning your data. Um, tokenization uh, of ownership and assets. This is also something, it's, it's been a very, very strong theme, and I think we're all familiar with this use case. I'm going to be talking about it a little bit in the next few slides. Um, but what I found is looking at all of these different use cases, um, really there are five common themes in terms of what blockchain enables um, across all of them. And that's written over here to the right. It's creation and movement of digital assets in real time, uh, digital representation of identity assets and ownership, um, time stamping and immutability of records, like for supply chain improvement and tracking, self-execution and enforcement of business logic with embedded trust rules, uh, and verifiability of information and resistance to single points of failure. So I'd like to talk about two mega cases, um, tokenization of assets and ownership, and also Web 3.0. I think uh, most of you were probably listening to Olga a couple of days ago. She gave a great talk about tokenization. Um, there are trillions of dollars in real world assets. Uh, that are illiquid due to market fragmentation. Um, there's a huge world that can be disrupted by bringing liquidity to an illiquid market and also by democratizing access to that market. Um, these asset descriptions that are hugely illiquid are private debt, invoices, private equity, real estate, and so on. We're talking hundreds of billions of dollars and trillions of dollars worth of market value. And the benefits of tokenization are not just bringing liquidity to an illiquid market and democratizing access, but it's also reducing the cost of asset issuance and ownership. It's also having a single tr set of truth of asset ownership if you were to build essentially an a, a global asset registry. Rules for asset transfer that are uh, encoded in the token contract, as well as legally enforceable asset ownership, and much, much more. Uh, the market is huge, and it's uh, it's it's a really exciting opportunity. There is room for so many players, and that's why collaboration is so important. Um, it's estimated that by 2027, 24 trillion dollars of these assets will be tokenized. And that's just not me or some, you know, McKinsey analysis. This is, this is the World Economic Forum that has estimated these numbers. And again, we're just right now a blip on the chart. Uh, but there's a lot of very strong sentiment that this is coming. Um, so a lot of players are creating marketplaces for tokenized assets, as all of you know, right? Um, it can be extremely broad or it can be very, very niche. Um, 
people are saying, okay, I, you know, companies are saying, I want to build um, an asset uh, marketplace for tokenized uh, invoices or securitized invoices. I want to build a platform for tokenizing non-fungible tokens such as uh, sports players and so on. Or I want to build a platform that's essentially an asset factory and I'm tokenizing every single asset in the world. So this is just a huge, huge application uh, that's, that's trending. Um, and essentially it's an ecosystem of asset issuers and investors. And what you can do with that ecosystem is you can match them by supply and demand in terms of what the investor wants to re receive in terms of the ROI and what the asset issuer is willing to place their asset at in terms of price. Um, this, uh, this platform uh, can be designed with several other uh, ancillary services, such as matching, matchmaking, as I just mentioned, uh, multi-currency on and off ramps, um, asset tokenization, of course, uh, built-in security checks and validation, including KYC and AML, um, zero-knowledge oracles, which keep your data private, um, and many other things. Um, I think I talked a lot about the value proposition for tokenized assets, right? Increased liquidity, reduced costs, reduced fraud, increased scale and access, uh, David, uh, data privacy and security, and improved user journey, which we're not there yet at all in blockchain, but ideally in the future we will be. Um, and the final thing I'd like to talk about is Web 3.0. So this is something that I just find extremely uh, exciting inspiring, and I think uh, it, it is inspiring to a lot of us, because this, it, it kind of ties all the concepts together, uh, right? We have to tokenized assets, and we have the internet of value, um, which is encompassed in all of, all of what I just talked about. Uh, but we also have um, a lot of additional technology that is going to make Web 3.0 even more exciting. So if we think about where we were uh, compared to where we are, starting with Web 1.0 in the late 90s, right? We had a readable era where you could just, you know, type in what you wanted to learn and you would get to a page and that was it. You know, it's sort of like the Dewey Decimal System going into a library and reading a book. Um, then we went to Web 2.0, which was, you know, the, the early 2000s to basically now, where it's readable, writable. And you know, you're essentially interacting with a lot of these web platforms. There's social media and so on. And so you can, it's, it's read and it's write, and you can interact with everyone on the platforms. Web 3.0 is going to be readable, writable, executable, empowered by blockchain, and also, you know, a myriad of other technologies, artificial intelligence. So computers will now understand information like a human being with semantic uh, language processing. Um, you're going to have a dramatic reduction of hacks in, and data breaches because the data will be decentralized. We'll have ubiquity in terms of devices being connected, right? The, through the Internet of Things, ideally you have all of your, your devices attached to the network. Um, interoperability is going to be a huge theme and a huge challenge. And we talked about that in a, a couple of panels over the last few days, interoperability of, you know, across multiple blockchains. Um, I think most importantly, though, is data ownership. So end users will regain complete control of their data. Like, you know, flipping the internet on its head. So you are the driver. You are in the driver's seat and you own the data. You own your browser data. You own your pictures and so on and so forth. And if you want to share your data, it's on a permission basis. Um, as I mentioned, security would be much higher and it would be decentralized, no central point of control. Um, so this is the reason I'm really inspired to be in this space, uh, aside from all of the other uh, use cases within blockchain. And that concludes my talk. Thank you so much for listening.